My life sucks. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. And I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And we're in election season in Canada. Not only is it election season, the election is literally a week away. Yeah. And it is. it has been a long slog. The longest in, what they say? 70 years Sounds about right. It, it, was, it's, it feels it's, longer than it is. It feels. It already feels like it has been an eternity. However, thankfully, it's not the States because theirs is like two years. Yeah, it is not. So, thankfully, we, we're a little bit more moderate. And today, I mean, so we did our weird election mm-hmm. podcast with Drew uh, a while back. And this will probably be a little weird, too. But uh, today, we wanted to get a little more serious and talk about, you know, some feelings around Canadian politics and things like that. But first, icebreaker. Mm-hmm. Ryan, who is your who who is your ideal prime minister? They have to be Canadian. Mm-hmm. But apart from that, sky's the limit. Please pick someone our audience has heard of. Yeah. So, for those of you at home listening, links are in the show notes in case you've never heard of them. Yeah. Or perhaps you're in your car or somewhere else. You should be aware that I paced Jim's room. A lot, trying to think of who I was going to choose for this one. A lot, and Jim tried really hard to help me. I tried sort so hard. through a lot of Canadians, and it was difficult because you know me. If you've been watching the show for a while, I always have two answers that I just can't choose between. This one, I had a hard time thinking of one ideal candidate for prime minister. And after much deliberation, and Google searching, and soul searching, I chose Ryan Gosling. I, I think you've chosen wisely. I think that there definitely could be worse. Um, there may be better, but Ryan Gosling, I think, gets my vote. And uh, and I'm going to say not just Ryan Gosling, the actor. I'll say Ryan Gosling the various characters that he portrays. So when we need an ass kicker, we get Ryan Gosling from Drive. When we need a tender, loving kind of person, we get Ryan Gosling from The Notebook. When we need a mythic hero to guide us through whatever we need to be guided through, we'll get Ryan Gosling, young Hercules. Um, He's kind, sweet, photogenic, Seems like a generally good guy, so I'm going to say Ryan Gosling for Prime Minister. Now, I understand that you, you picked a Canadian actor, mm-hmm. but I, and this is not my official answer, but if you'd picked Nathan Fillion, mm-hmm. you could have got, when you needed an ass kicker, you could have got Nathan Fillion from Firefly, and when you needed a moral guide, you could have got Nathan Fillion from Firefly, and <laughs> when you needed someone with leadership skills, you could have got Nathan Fillion from Firefly. I'm just saying that yeah. there's options. Yeah, Mal's good. The problem is is I, I don't want a, th- like a thief with a heart of gold. I need somebody who starts with a fairly decent... Mal, Mal Reynolds is a man with a heart of gold who happens to be a thief, yeah. sir. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want somebody to be in the middle of doing something wrong and realize that maybe they're not doing the right thing and that there's a better option. I, I kind of want somebody from the outset who was like... No, we are not going to go and hit up this train. No, we are not going to, you know, raid these people. Um, Sometimes you, know. you do what needs doing, right? However, I, I wouldn't mind a prime minister that gets stranded naked somewhere and takes it with a lot of grace. Like, he, he really, he did not. That's true, that's he, true. He was just, he stood up proudly being naked in the yep. middle of the desert. So I, I suppose there's, uh, maybe he can be, well, we don't have a vice president, you know. No, he could be opposition leader. Opposition Nathan Fillion Nathan, for opposition. Nathan leader. leader uh, Nathan Fillion, I would say, would be a good of the Hammer Party. Of the Hammer. The party. Hammer. No, you know what? Never mind. No. Um, so my, I on the other hand have two answers. Whoa. And in a in a in a weird reversal, my first answer is Margaret Atwood. Uh, if you are not from Canada, the first rule of Canada is don't fuck with Margaret Atwood. Margaret Atwood is a prolific Canadian author, a writer of columns, an incredible human being on Twitter. She's she's wonderful and hilarious and well spoken and elderly and she will kick your ass. <laughs> she's like the Canadian Terminator, only better written and mm. with more character development and with some kind of like really insightful message that takes three readings to get to really dig out. But yeah, Margaret Atwood, brilliant Canadian author. Um 
would make an excellent prime minister, I'm sure, because rule one of Canada is don't fuck with Margaret Atwood. My other option, though, and mm-hmm. it is also a pretty good option, is Wayne Gretzky. Okay. I mean, Wayne Gretzky, formerly of the Los Angeles Kings, formerly of the Edmonton Oilers. Mm-hmm. Um, long-time coach and now, I guess, retired hockey guy. He coached Team Canada in that big, huge deal Team Canada win in, like, 2001. Mm-hmm. Like, there was a lot of stuff going on with Wayne Gretzky. He's, he's a big he's a big name hockey guy, but most importantly, when Wayne Gretzky was, like, breaking the record for goals in a season, he always had more assists than goals. Like, that... That is what I want in a prime minister. I want a person who's like, no matter how good they are at a thing, no matter how many accolades and prizes they could win by being even better at it, when they see an opportunity to help someone else succeed, they take it. That is the kind of person I want. As a person who often requires assists. And a person who understands that when you can't get a goal, an assist will do. Mm -hmm. So that is my either Margaret Atwood or Wayne Gretzky or some kind of like Atwood Gretzky hybrid like the Atsky or the the Wayne Atwood Gretwood Gretwood I like that <laughs> Gretwood Please don't build a Margaret Atwood Wayne Gretzky hi- hybrid that would be scary as hell <laughs> Internet, go to work. I'm just no. I'm just like picturing this shambling hulk of flesh, sort of moaning out of one, like one of its many mouths. You have to skate where the fuck is going to be. No, I I would imagine more of a Dragon Ball Z. They do the the fusion like a fusion dance. <laughs> fusion, ha! and uh, and then they. I mean, you they're not me fusion. Sorry, anybody. and then they. Thank you. They don't. Uh, they're not exactly the right. Or it's the same height and weight and stuff. So maybe they need the with the Pora earrings. But then that's a permanent <laughs> fusion. And sometimes you just need an Atwood. And sometimes oh, man. you just need a Gretzky. It's true, it's true. I mean I don't know, does, does Atwood have her own line of wine? I know Gretzky does. I don't I don't think so. It's uh, yeah. not really her jam. She has a column in the National Post. No, but she endorsed a beer. I remember that. There was one where she wrote she endorsed Check it. the show notes for a Marriott Atwood endorsed beer yeah. and a link to Wayne Gretzky wine, apparently. Yeah. Um yeah, you're you you are Brilliant in the ways of booze, as always. There are benefits to me having my vices. So, in case the icebreaker didn't fill you in on the fact that we are not a particularly serious group of human beings, we're no. not. No. And we are also not political science experts. No. We're not foreign policy experts. We're not economists. No. Uh, we're not statisticians who are experts in polls. No. Uh, we're not... What else aren't we? We aren't campaign managers. We're barely adults. We're not politicians. Oh, yeah, basically. Yeah. We're, the point being that uh, we're not experts in anything, and we would not presume to advise you, with the election a week away, who to vote for or a party to endorse. The punchline, I feel like, that is, is just like, you know, no, vote for this per But seriously, like, we're... We're not attempting or, or, or purporting to any expertise. This is just sort of a bunch of weird observations about Canadian politics. Our only qualification, I would say, or qualifications, is we happen to be born here. I have we, voted in many elections. We happen to be old enough to vote. We happen to have voted before. And we periodically pay attention to current events. Sometimes, yeah. So yeah. When, when there is nothing else inter- interesting on the internet. Yeah, so really what we're saying is we have barely a basic level of competency. I wouldn't listen to me on foreign policy. Uh, like, I think my foreign policy advice is be friends, don't shoot anybody. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, like, it's not really nuanced. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are lots of people who have much more nuanced opinions about that. If you want information about the parties, you can find them in the show notes Mm -hmm. uh, because we're going to put them there because there is an election. I'm also not advocating that you vote because I don't do that. You can see that in our our post from last week. Mm -hmm. But um, I am advocating that you do whatever you think is right. Mm -hmm. That said, there are some really weird things that we've noticed about Canadian politics. Yeah. It's... um it's interesting. I don't know how much of it is just a natural progression of things in Canada, or if it's um, in some ways um, influenced by what's going on in the states. Like you take that kind of hyperactive 
um, Republican Democrat thing in the states, and it gets applied here. You know, like um, I, I pointed out in the the pre-show that a lot of times I think people confuse. Well, the average Canadian I, I find tends to confuse a lot of things. So, for example, that we can't keep our national or our federal and our provincial party straight. Oftentimes, yes. we confuse the two of them. So, like when people complain, so I work at a bar. People complain about the smoking laws. They'll blame the conservatives when in fact it was the provincial liberals but they they're so primed to hate the conservative the, the canadian conservative party the national party uh that they'll, they'll make that mistake but also i think that just before you jump in um the other really big thing I, I i find is that um the power vested in the office of the president of the united states is fundamentally a different stru- power structure than the office of the prime minister the prime minister's office pmo um, I think a lot of people tend to think that the prime minister has as much of control over the executive functioning of the government the way the president does. The president is, I believe, still the only individual on the planet that is both the head of state and the head of government, I think is the way they phrase it. In Canada, we have two. We have the prime minister who's the head of government and we have the queen who's the head of state. But at, for every other country, I believe those hmm. powers are divested to, to, to at least two or more people. President, prime minister kind of deal. Correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me off in the show, or the show notes. Below the show notes in the comments. But um, the, the president has one of those unique roles and has a lot of power. Whereas the prime minister has a lot of power. But not as much power, I, I would, think, as a lot of. I would people say the prime minister like, has a lot of influence. Yeah, that's probably a better way to describe it to to keep that those two separate. Because I mean, the fact that Stephen Harper, who is the head of the Conservative Party of Canada, if you are not Canadian or not following along, tends to have a reputation of having a micro control over his party. Uh, but it's really like an influence thing. Like he he. Instead of using a party whip, he whips the party himself in, in the line. <laughs> well, and it's that notion that, uh, like, as a prime minister, you have a cabinet, and, mm-hmm. and, and you, you, you benefit from certain things. But it's not like America, where, you know, the president is the head of the executive branch of government. Mm-hmm. The president can do things like, um, you know, pardon people. He can write executive orders, which are essentially, like, micro-laws. Mm-hmm. You know, like you can make an executive order. However, the next president can rescind that order should they choose to. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of sort of sort of different and nuanced uh, differences between mm-hmm. the president and, and the prime minister. So the prime minister of Canada yeah, is just sort of this person. I I think ideally, and then the way it's sort of set up to be is just this sort of person. But often. And it becomes a conflict, not just of because they are the the the, the person who becomes prime minister is the leader of their party. Mm. It the election becomes a conflict, not just of the parties, mm-hmm. but of the party leaders. Mm-hmm. It's not you know this election isn't just liberals and NDP and Green and conservatives battling it out. This is Mulcair and Trudeau and Harper and May and I got those completely out of order and I'm mm-hmm. totally fine with that <laughs> um, and Doucette uh, not Doucette uh, uh, Jill's Jill Doucette G- Giuseppe. sure also Jill Doucette yeah who, probably run, a who runs a party that runs only in Quebec yeah. and has a reasonably good showing there but no, well not in the last one the last one they no. lost a lot of seats yeah to they the did NDP, but, uh, yeah it ultimately comes down to Justin Trudeau's plan uh, just as of filming, he released uh, an 88-page document outlining uh, what he would do for, I believe, student loans. I'm super excited to read that. It was, it was actually, it was actually really. really interesting, uh, but unfortunately, I am if if what he said is going to be true, uh, I unfortunately do not qualify for that anymore. Did you hear about it? No. Apparently, the plan was is um, no student loan payments are required of of uh, former students when you make less than twenty five thousand a year. Well, I I'm clearly outside of that. I now. think I, I think that despite that, you're doing okay. Yeah, so. I think that you're you're probably doing fine. I mean, it, like that yeah. seems like a perfectly reasonable yeah you know set of set of circumstances. I have certainly been in the position where I was making less than that and had to make student loan payments. Yeah, uh, and it sucks. But but yeah, like there's it it, it comes down to Justin Trudeau's plan or yeah. you know Stephen Harper's scheme or Elizabeth May's platform. I don't know what Elizabeth... Like, Elizabeth May doesn't really associate herself. She's too busy 
aggravating all the other parties and reminding them of all the issues they should be talking about. Except when they talk about it. In that case, she talks about the other issues that they should be talking about. There's that. Yeah. But um, Thomas Mulcair, I know, also has a student loan plan. Beyond that, I don't know much about it. Mm. But and again, we're not here to advocate a particular party or a particular platform. But it it's the it becomes this conflict between leaders, mm-hmm. which is weird because it's not supposed to be. Because mm-hmm. you don't vote for the leader, you vote for the party, unless you're voting for the leader, or you're voting for the local candidate. There's this weird bit of Canadian. Double think. I'm really curious if this is the same in Britain because I already know our, our system is modeled off of the British system, mm-hmm. where if you are upset, if Ryan, for example, is 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 he does not wish to vote Liberal, and I think that he should. I did not, but um, I think I think that he should. And he's like, well, I, I don't really feel for the party. Well, you have three different things. You have your local candidate who represents your riding in the in the House of Commons, which is our version of Congress. Or at least they're supposed to. Yeah, they they're they're supposed to. They're the ones that get voted in, and they you have the party, which has a certain platform and ideology, and and everybody ideally in the party is bound up in that, except when they're not. Mm-hmm. And then you have the party leader, who is the leader of that party, who's sort of pushed to the top of that pyramid and reluctantly accepts the mantle of leadership um, and becomes the most powerful person on Sussex Drive. Which is where the Prime Minister's house is. Yeah, not to be confused with Pennsylvania. Which is not where the (laughs) Prime Minister's house is. But if Ryan is like, I I don't really think the Liberal Party platform matches my ideals, then I... As a Canadian would say, and who and and who does agree with the little Liberal Party platform would instead say, "Oh well, w- look at the leadership." Mm-hmm. I mean, Justin Trudeau is at the peak of his political career right now. I mean, some of the ads are saying that he's not ready, but he is this—he is the same age as the current Prime Minister was when he took office. Yeah. Like he's he's clearly an ex- experienced in politics. Etc. Etc. Or I would say, well, look at your local candidate. Which one of your local candidates speaks to you? Mm-hmm. And similarly, if he's upset with his local candidate, I can be like, no, 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 no. But the look at what the party stands for. Mm-hmm. Look at the leadership. If he's upset with the leadership, I'd be like, no, no, no. It's not about the leadership. It's about the party platform, and it's ultimately it's about which of your local candidates really speaks to. Like, there's no matter. What portion of that party or any party that Ryan is pissed off at, I can come up with some kind of answer mm-hmm. that instructs him to vote along the line that I want him to. Yeah. By just focusing on a different element, which is sort of really weird because you never really know what part to vote for. Yeah, because on our ballots, it's you get, well, you, you don't get one choice, but of the three things that you're deciding, it's only done by one vote. So, And then you have all of the candidates yeah. in your riding. So yeah. really it is, when I vote for a person, I am voting for them as my member of parliament, mm-hmm. them as a member of a party, and them as an underling to a leader of a party. Yep. You don't get to, like, mix and match. No. Although that would be pretty awesome. You're like, listen, I really want I really I want William Shatner to be prime minister. Mm-hmm. But I don't like his party platform, so I'm thinking I'm going to go with NDP. And then it's like cafeteria Canadian. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'd really like, like, like you're just like, give me the Shatner combo, but instead of the fries, give me a bunch of that orange stuff. It's pureed squash, sure. Just yeah. give me that. Give me the orange stuff. And then for um, uh, for something for the local, uh, what are they? What are they? What are these? Are these? Are these? Locally grown, locally sourced bean sprouts. I'll take those. I'll take. I'll take the bean sprouts. So, like locally, I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a Green Party guy. I'm a hippie. You know, federally, I'm 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 you know I'm orange. I'm NDP. But but for the leader, I really William Shatner's just got great hair, man. Yeah, he's just got great hair, and he's so articulate. Oh yeah, I mean, so what if his debate took three hours? 
He got his point across. Exactly. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> that would be that would be a weird electoral system. It was like you'd come out of the polls and you like, all right, they've counted all the votes, and um some party didn't get any seats, but somehow they also control the House of Commons. Mm. Uh, and William Shatner is the Prime Minister now. Yeah. How did he even get on the ballot? We're kind of rambling here, but uh, I'm going to go off script for just a second. Because uh, <gasps> I know. One of the things I noticed in this election that I don't remember from the previous one, but it is, it is everywhere, um, is how, how the internet and how social media is being used against you. So, like, obviously these are political individuals who... Um, are not native to the platforms that are coming back essentially to bite them in the ass. Oh yes, and it's really yes. interesting to see that. <laughs> the, so, like, I don't know if uh, if somebody's being paid to basically dredge the entire social media history of an individual and pull up things like the the one candidate who she had made some some poor choice jokes about Auschwitz. Uh, it wasn't even... It was, what, what good choice jokes about concentration camps are there? Fair enough. I was going to say a poor, a poor comments or whatever, but she yeah. made a joke, and oddly enough, it was she made a joke on somebody else's photo. I don't know if the person had mentioned that they were at Auschwitz, but apparently the candidate did... So this was seven years ago. She didn't know what Auschwitz was. She saw a picture of her friend hugging a pole and made a comment about the phallic symbol. So I don't know the full, like, the the true context. I only have what's been filtered at me through the media. But, I mean, like, this comment from seven years ago that was apparently on somebody else's photo was resurfaced and used against her. Like, these aren't, you know, like, tweets made last year about... You know, abortions or immigrants or something like this is something that's that's been dragged. I'm, I'm a really big fan. I, I will try and dig up this story about the candidate who shared his dating advice in quotes. Dating advice. Sorry, listeners. I had to provide actual air quotes for the <laughs> viewers. Apologies for the repetition. But um, which was it wasn't. Abusive, but it was deeply insensitive, mm. and um, you know, naturally there was a, there was a bunch of fallout from that, and you know, there's there's been a bunch of cases, and there always are where we're like candidates just just say stuff, or often and and often it's not it's not necessarily candidates, it's staffers. Mm-hmm. Like when you when you entrust that kind of media presence to your staffers, you have yeah. to make sure that they don't they don't just shoot off their mouth. When they get angry at the internet. I sort of look forward, and I think we've talked about this, we talked about this in season one, when we were talking about internet things. I look forward to an era where everyone has done something ridiculously stupid on the internet. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Like, where, where there's no person who can grab that moral high ground. Like, admittedly, like, if you were... Uh, you know, cracking jokes at the expense of others or, like, punching down and things like that. Like, that is a thing that um, you deserve to catch hell for. Mm. Like, that is a thing that is not okay. And there should be no notion that, no, no, these are just these are just idle comments. And, like, they're idle comments in a public forum. You need to be aware of that. You mm. need to be more sensitive to that. But just in terms of, like, being an idiot on the Internet, Mm. And I really look forward to it because I think that things will get exponentially more ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And the secrets that start coming out will be even weirder. They'll be like, do you remember when uh, they made this video on their YouTube channel? Not their political YouTube channel, but their personal YouTube channel. Mm. uh, Where they balanced a ukulele on their head and uh, sang a Bob Marley song. Yeah. Actually, that was me. Yeah. Um, When I go into politics, that'll be the thing. Actually, that wasn't a ukulele. I bounced a skateboard on my head. Um, not for very long, but it was uh, it was definitely a thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, just like weird, stupid stuff. If I ever go to politics, this channel is going to ruin me, and I'm really sort of looking forward to it. the The best reaction I've seen so far, I don't recall her name, but there was one candidate. Well, uh, yeah, you basically like. Um, so Jim Tegwell, you didn't exist up until four years ago. Yeah. 
<laughs> I did not. Uh, but no, the best the best reaction I've seen so far. Like I said, I don't remember her name. I should have I should have prepared for this, but it was just off the top of my head, spur of the thing, where she basically spun it as, yeah, I said that, and I was wrong. I've I've come I've come to learn why that is wrong. And like she so she owned the fact that she said it, and she's like, no, absolutely, that was that was a stupid thing that I said. I've grown up since then. Yeah. You know, the, the, there must have been some elapsed time. Like if, some, if you said something last year, it might, the uh, com or a rebuttal like that would be a little bit more suspect. But like, but seven years is a long time. Yeah, I mean, I was a completely different person seven years ago. Yeah, I, I was a completely different person last week. Sometimes, but I mean, like seven years ago, shit, five years ago, I've come, I've changed so much as an individual in five years, let alone like seven years, ten years, making some sort of weird mm-hmm. comment. I mean, it's not just that culture changes. It is, like, I've learned a lot about, like, for example, the punching down idea. Like, before that was never really a thing. A, a joke was a joke was a joke was a joke, right? As opposed to, no, like, there is punching up, punching sideways, punching down. There are some jokes that we just have to hold ourselves to a standard that we don't do. It's not cool to do that, those kinds of things. Yeah. And I only learned that probably in the last two years. Right? So, I mean, there's probably stuff about me out there that would preclude me from it. Or I'm going to have to do some serious apologizing. Serious, genuine apologizing. I feel like that would be a great thing for for candidates to open with, is to, like, dredge their own social media history and open with an apology for all of the stuff that they have done. And be like, uh, Dark Force 909, I'm really sorry I called you a shithead. But Justin Bieber is the best, <laughs> and I don't care what you think. And oh, that would be amazing. I would love to see every political campaign begin with like a lengthy internet apology or or an apology for internet misbehavior. Yeah, like listen, I didn't, and and you, you that way it gets it all out in the open, and everybody owns it. Yeah, and you get to see how bad it is. Mm-hmm. Where you're like, I I didn't really mean anything I said on Xbox Live about your mother. I'm sure that she's an incredibly pleasant lady. She's a kind and gentle soul! She just loves (laughs) potatoes! That would be brilliant. And I look forward to that day, and I feel like it's only ten years off. Yeah, so, uh, but the, just to bring it bring it back to my the original point of, like, that is something really interesting that, I don't know if it's going on stateside, but you see a lot of candidates that are getting fired or willfully dropped or just whatever. Mm-hmm. They're just exiting from the, from the campaign for one reason or another, often because of something discovered. Everything from peeing into a coffee cup to... Uh, there was a young NDP candidate from Alberta who was um, on a heavy metal cover album. Like, I don't know, she was like passed out or something, and the band was around there. It was kind of provocative, but kind of harmless. It was more just the implied badness of it. Uh, but I guess she also said some bad stuff on social media. Um, just, you realize you're going to have to dig up everything you're mentioning here. Yeah. But I, I, I think what we've learned from this is is the baby from the Nirvana album cover for president really is... Oh, it, was, it was honest. It was honest. <laughs> what, well, uh, you were associated with a band, um, you know, in in your youth. And like, well, first off, I was a baby. And second off, that band was rad. <laughs> they rocked. Yeah. So I don't have a I don't have a point beyond that. Just like this, this is the first time I noticed it. It's going to be interesting next election. Oh yeah, to see I mean where it's going to be weird. We'll we'll probably do another thing. Yeah. The thing I notice about uh, Canadian politics, and this is I think also true in every nation, is the prime minister gets blamed for everything. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting in the in the last eight eight years nine years, yeah. uh, under under the Conservative government and under Stephen Harper. There has been this, you know, sort of reputation that he has as, as maintaining tight control over the party. That's how he's been able to accomplish a lot of these really, really dark, dystopian, present, future things. Is by, like, maintaining iron control over their votes and thus making sure that any bill he needs to can get passed through the House of Commons... Uh, which where it goes to the Senate, 
Uh, it, the Canadian government's weird, but it goes to the Senate, and then it has to come back, and there's a lot of convoluted things. But it gets like I, I feel like, and I'm going to catch some flack for this, but I feel like in some parts of this respect. Stephen Harper is misunderstood, or at the very least, blamed for stuff that is not his fault. Like, we get mad at him because he keeps this iron control over his party, which means that members of parliament that we elected, because they were the people we actually voted for, uh, if we voted for them, are prevented from voting the way that the people who voted for them would want to vote. They're instead forced to vote along the party line. And that's a thing that a lot of people have a deep problem with. But, you know, so Stephen Harper exerts too much control. At the same time, there's been a lot of scandals related to uh, members of Parliament and members of the Senate that, that, that are in Stephen Harper's camp uh, in the Conservative Party, or involved with the Conservative Party. And, you know, everything from robocalls to money laundering stuff. Like, not like, not like sex, drugs, and rock and roll, uh, rock and roll scandals, but like serious fraudulent things and we get mad at Stephen Harper we're like why isn't he exerting enough control why he's responsible for letting these these people do these things like we if we can't as simultaneously ask a person to loosen up and tighten their grip it just doesn't I mean if he is blameless for something it is probably one of those things Mm -hmm. um there's probably a conditional statement that makes that true. Like, if you are going to control your entire party with an iron fist, then these kinds of things should not happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but but I, I don't feel like those are two things we can get mad about at the same time. But, I mean, even outside of that, I feel like your job as Prime Minister, maybe, is to just get blamed for everything. Like, because you don't really do much. You're not the president. You can't write executive orders. You're not the commander-in-chief of the military forces. You have cabinet. You do have to make decisions. Mm. But, like, it's sort of just because we need somebody to sign that paper. And it seems really weird and really frightening because, I mean, everything you do, you do not just as yourself, but as, as, as part of the government of Canada. I mean, there was this thing was it four years ago five years ago when Stephen Harper wanted to change the name of the government of Canada on documents to the Harper government oh did he yeah no I yeah. don't even remember I'll that. dig it up I'll dig it up for the show notes but it was definitely a thing I remember Rick Mercer doing a rant about it mm. it never flew obviously we're, we're still it's still the government of Canada and everything but it's this notion that when you inherit the government of Canada when you come sort of into that office you in you you you, you carry the weight of this century old almost 150 years Mm. uh, machine this immortal thing that has done lots of good things but also committed many atrocities (coughs) sorry I'm also just getting over a cold but that weight has to be terrifying for anybody. I mean, I mean, the notion that you want to do something at that point. I mean, there, we, we always joke about those do-nothing prime ministers like, like Joe Clark or Paul Martin. Mm-hmm. But, those, I mean, what those prime ministers do for the time that they are in office is carry that weight. And I think one of the big questions that we're always sort of really... When we're asking if a candidate is ready or we're asking if a party is a federal, like, like, ready to compete at the federal level, you know. The Green Party gets that all the time. Like, oh, they're good, but I don't think they're really, like, a run-the-country kind of party. Uh, and they're not really trying to run the country. They just want to, like, raise some opposition or raise some hell. Mm-hmm. But there is this... The really the question we are asking is are they ready to carry this burden? Are they ready to shoulder this burden for four years or longer? And probably add to it. I mean, because every government is gonna is gonna carry with it mistakes. Um, like you, for every for every victory, you've got something that's gone wrong. Probably, ideally not. And what we are looking for is just somebody who can shoulder that for a while. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that this is the, that's like this for a lot of, of of world leaders. I mean, if you you're the president of the United States or the prime minister of Great Britain or the president of France or the president of Russia, like you just you have to be able to carry that. I mean, the thing that terrifies us about Putin is that he carries it so easily. Mm-hmm. Like, like the thing that worries people about Putin is that he's just like, yeah, sometimes you just got to kill a few people. What's the problem? And we're like, oh my god. Because there's this huge moral weight, and we expect you to feel that weight. Yeah. It reminds me of um, this one great scene from uh, <clears throat> The West Wing, um, where the president, he's sitting there, and the priest comes in, and uh, it's his, like his pastor from his church, and he says... Uh, you know, what do I call you? Because up all up before the presidency, you know, he was Jed Bartlett. And uh, do, you, do I call you Jed, Mr. President? And he says, Jed says, you know, I, mis- I prefer Mr. President. And then the priest is like, okay, yeah, no problem. And he says, no, no, you don't understand. Um, by referring to me by the title, it reminds me that I'm not a man, but I'm a, basically a, a symbol for the office, and I have a responsibility that goes along with that. Yeah. And so it's good to remind yourself of that. So it's, to a certain degree, the Prime Minister does become that symbolic head, but also whipping boy, or whipping yeah. post, not the boy, but the whipping post of of the party. That All the successes do tend to get credited to you, uh, but every failure whether or not it was your direct action or because it was somebody in like your responsibility, um, you're ultimately responsible for the party, so you're the one who gets blamed for it. So, you know, like the F, was it, the F-15 mm-hmm. deal, you know, it's ultimately comes down on the Harper government. Um, the, si- the silencing of the, the scientists... I'm not 100% convinced that it was Harper who said silence them. It was definitely his office because yeah. everything is and all the full You become of- responsible for all of those things. It's, exactly. I compare it to Atlas because as soon as you step into that office, as soon as you, you're, you're sort of awarded it, and it is weird to me that this is a thing that people want. Mm-hmm. Um, like you are now, you whether you like it or not, the way that people regard it is you become responsible for the fates of not just 35 million people who live in this country, mm-hmm. but of all kinds of people all over the world. The fates of refugees, the fates of countries in which people believe that or require Canada's intervention, uh, you know, the fates of people and nations whose trade agreements were entwined in. Like There's this huge, complex... Mess, and on top of that, you inherit all of our history. Mm-hmm. You know, and you inherit things that you can't ever make right. Mm-hmm. Like there's no apology that can be delivered. There's no money that can be given that will make these things right. Whether that's veterans' affairs, or you know, residential schools, or like there are things that you just can't come back from but you still have to carry it with you because the second you stop carrying it with you, you forget. Mm-hmm. And you start you start telling people it doesn't matter. And the people who it matters to are still very much here. And you forget about those people. And yeah, that is just... That is, like, that is a terrifying weight. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that is sort of unconsciously what we are thinking about or what we are aware of when we are looking at candidates and going... Are they ready? Jello Biafra joked once that the people, the person that the United States voters will vote for is the person they can stomach to see on television for the next four years. But I wonder if it isn't also that question of can they carry this burden? And do do I trust them to carry this burden? More so than party lines, more so than anything else. It's just, this is the person who will have to shoulder this. Mm-hmm. Can they do it? And you can't learn that about anybody, I think, until they've done it. Yeah. I mean, unless they self-identify. I could never do that. I don't have the expertise. I don't have the experience. I don't have the advisors. 
Because, I mean, it's not just carrying that burden. It's adding to it. It's making decisions and helping to make decisions and being responsible for decisions that people you have never even met are going to make. Mm -hmm. People you will never meet are going to make that are going to ultimately fall on your shoulders. And I think sometimes we, we look at that with like world leaders and we think that that's noble. I mean, you look at Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs, where it's this notion that like the, the world stood on the brink of annihilation and it took you know, two men talking on a phone to, to make that stop. And the, the terror and stress that would have been put involved in that. But it's also a little everyday stuff. Like, it's just, it just adds up. Mm -hmm. I can barely carry my own life, let alone 35 million other people's, and we don't even live in a very large country. No. Like, the States is 350 million. Yeah, we beat them by geography, and that's about it. Yeah. I mean, and in the States, you've got tons of people in prison. You've got tons of people in the military. You've got, like, there's so much more. That got really heavy. Yeah. Which is kind of funny, because when you first suggested we talk politics, I remembered back when we were pre-showing for the first round of the politics thing, and you knocked me down a peg saying that, you know, I can come in and talk about politics this, politics that, but ultimately it doesn't necessarily always matter to a person who's not represented at all by anyone. That was, that was season one. That yeah. was season one, and then I've, I've been reticent to talk about politics since, because you did knock me down a peg, and then suddenly you're like, I want to talk about politics before the election, it's like, <laughs> Jim's got something to say. I didn't until the pre-show, <laughs> and then I did, but yeah, there's sort of weird, curious things about about Canadian government, the Canadian, and, and the sort of the Canadian election cycle. Um, it's not silly enough. Because we only have 35 million people, we don't have enough, like, really, really ludicrous candidates. We have just enough. Mm -hmm. We don't have a Donald Trump. I'm really thankful for that. Yeah. I'm really, really, I have no idea how Americans are dealing with it right now. With a sense of humor, I hope. <laughs> I imagine, I, I, I remember it, Stewart's, like, last 20 shows or whatever where. Trump first announced his candidacy and it was just like, oh, praise the Lord! <laughs> Comedy gold for the rest of my career! Comedians everywhere are lighting candles! Yeah, no. Thankfully we don't have that. We have our own issues to deal with, but... Yeah. But we don't have anything that loud and that ludicrous. Yeah. Wow. Ah. Anyway, whoever you vote for or don't vote for, I wish you the best of luck, and hopefully we will all have the power to share to share that burden over the next four years mm -hmm. when we deal with whatever the hell we got to deal with in the next four years. Yeah. So I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. <laughs> intro time! You realize I'm putting that in the outro, right? Oh, oh that's on the outro?